I can't tell you what uh, an honor and a pleasure it is to be asked to speak here. Um, a friend of mine, uh, Bill Drentel, um, told me about this conference a few years ago. He said, yeah, they're trying to take the skills and techniques of design to help improve healthcare. I'm like, wow, what a crazy idea. It's a great idea. It's a fantastic idea. Um, and, and it's uh, fantastic. It's, I, I'm so impressed that I got asked <laughs> to be here, to be part of that. Um, you've heard a lot this morning about population health. I'm going to scale this down a little bit. I'm just an internist. I don't deal with populations. I deal with patients. And so I want to talk about medicine and healthcare the way I see it. So I'm very interested in diagnosis. Um, grows naturally enough, uh, or it grew naturally enough uh, out of my column. I was interested in diagnosis before my column. That's how, I, that's how come I started writing the column. But one of the things that my column did was show me diagnostic error, something I'd really never thought about. But really, for me to know that a case is difficult, for me to communicate that a case is a tough case, and these aren't just bad doctors, is to show that this patient had been to see other doctors and they thought they'd figured it out or hadn't thought they figured it out. And in any case, their diagnoses had been wrong, and that this patient was in desperate need of a diagnosis. Um, when I started working for House, it was the same idea. In order to make the show last an entire hour, the patient had to be wrongly diagnosed, oh, many times. Six on average. So for me, diagnostic error was all about the zebras. These rare, obscure diseases that only somebody as brilliant as House or brilliant as the doctors I feature in my column could know about, could figure out, could read about, could look up, that they were the oddities. And then a good, my patient, Shirley, is she up there? Came in to see me. Uh, so this is Shirley. She's been my patient for many years. She's 83 years old. Um, and as you can see from the oxygen tubing she's wearing under her nose, she's had a long, difficult struggle with tobacco. She finally gave it up a few years ago when it just got to be too big of a hassle turning off the oxygen every time she wanted to light up. So good for her. She was finally able to quit, definitely in the 60% in Lauren's slides. But she called me up one day and she said, it's back. Like, what's back? She goes, you know, my emphysema. So people who have emphysema, you probably know, not only live their lives feeling constantly short of breath with a cough and maybe a wheeze, but they have these flare-ups of their disease called exacerbations where everything just gets much, much worse. And that requires acute medical care. She goes, it's back. I can't breathe. I'm wheezing so loud I can't hear the television. And I'm coughing like crazy. I said, well, you need to come in and see me. And she said, are you kidding? I just told you I'm sick. There's snow outside. I could fall. We'd had this fight before. Normally, I could get her to come in, but not this time. She said she just didn't feel well enough to leave her house. Can't you just call in some steroids and antibiotics? You've done it before. I had. So I said, OK, but you have to promise me that you'll call me in a week and let me know how you're feeling. Fine. A week later, she calls me. I'm not any better. So what do you mean you're not any better? And for the first time, I started to be afraid. You know, if you're a doctor, you know that fear. When something is happening that's bad for your patient and you're not sure what it is, that fear, it's really indescribable. It's like a heart. It's like a hand of ice around your heart. And I said, what do you mean you're not better? She said, I'm not better. If anything, I think I'm worse. It's, I'm even shorter of breath. I still have my cough. I'm still wheezing all the time. I said, well, now you have to go to the hospital. She said, no, we had this conversation. I'm never going to the hospital again. If I'm going to die, I'm going to die at home with my bird and my cat and my sons and their children. 
They all lived in a small neighborhood. I said, well then, come and see me. She goes, are you listening to me? I just told you I'm sicker than I was last week, and last week I was too sick to come see you. Are you paying attention? So that only left one alternative. And at lunch, I packed up my car and went out to see her. She lived uh, in a small town near where I worked. As Soon as I walked in, I could see she was struggling. I mean, she looked bad. She was breathing rapidly. Um, her lips were, had that kind of bluish tint that's always awkward to see in a patient, not in a hospital. I put the pulse oximeter on her finger. And anybody who doesn't know what a pulse oximeter is here probably has never had one that's a, a reading that's lower than 100% because that's normal. But hers was 83%. And, and I, it's a scary number, but I wasn't surprised because, of course, I could tell she was in respiratory distress. What I was surprised by was her heart rate. Somebody, a normal heart rate, 70, 80, 90, somebody in this kind of distress, 100, 120. Hers was 30. And suddenly, I understood that I had made an error, an important error, a possibly life-threatening error, that what was trying to kill her was not her lungs, but her heart. And I said, now you have to go to the hospital. We had a fight. She said, I'm not going. No, you're, you're going. I explained, your lungs, we can't fix that. You're right to stay home. But your heart, we can fix that like that. We'll give you a pacemaker. You'll be better than new. With some persuasion, she finally went. She got a pacemaker. She's fine. I took this picture. My daughter took this picture last week. Doesn't she look great? Um, Shirley taught me what I should have already known, because I'd seen studies that said this. Shirley taught me that diagnostic error is not about the zebras. It's all about the horses. Most diagnostic errors are made not with these bizarre diseases that House loved so much, or that are often in my column. It's about the everyday stuff, and that's where we miss the boat. Uh, a guy named Hardeep Singh looked at a 1,000 cases of diagnostic error in his community. He's at Baylor. Here are the top eight most commonly misdiagnoses. Acute renal failure. Pneumonia, cancer, congestive heart failure. OK, spinal cord compression is a little bit unusual. But anemia, urinary tract infection, side effects from medications. This is bread and butter. And we're missing it. We're missing it. 10% of the population, it is said, has one rare disease or another. Honey, a whole lot more have these things. So these are what we miss when we miss uh, diagnoses. And this is common. I mean, you can imagine, given the diagnosis that we, that we see here. So everybody knows this number, this 98,000 deaths a year caused by medical errors. This came out in uh, the historic now a report from 1999 from the Institute of Medicine. So the great metaphor, and as a writer, I just love that this movement was launched by a metaphor. The equivalent of a jumbo jet, a 747, crashing every day for a year. That's what we're talking about uh, with medical errors. It's a lot of errors. So recently, somebody tried to figure out how many diagnostic errors there were. So they used the same kind of techniques that, was that were used by the Institute of Medicine to come up with this number. And they came up with a different number. This is not included in the Institute of Medicine's number. They don't even mention diagnostic error. It's too fraught, it's, and we'll get into that. But it's, it, they went for the low-hanging fruit, wrong leg surgery, wrong medications, things like that. So diagnostic error, 80,000 deaths each year. OK, not a 747. Maybe it's a 737 still. It's a lot of deaths. And these are just the people who die. It's not including the people who are maimed 
or the people who suffer from all of this. So, what is a diagnostic error? I mean, I've been talking about it. Is there a definition? Of course, there has to be a definition. So, Mark Graber, who's one of the people who was involved in this early, defined it as a diagnosis that's unintentionally delayed, wrong, or missed once you know what the right answer is. Sounds reasonable. Here's the problem. Where do we start counting for that? So when I was in training, uh, and anybody who's been uh, in a medical environment knows that doctors are routinely wrong on their way to being right. That's how we explain it. That's how we can normalize the fact that if somebody has something and we miss it the first one or two or three times, that's what we say. And it's true. We start with the most common things and move out to the more obscure things, or that's what we tell ourselves. So given that that's part of the process, where do we start counting? How many are you allowed? So there's some people who want to make diagnostic error sort of a like a baseball error. So in baseball, people who grew up with baseball probably know this, but I only learned this as an adult. An error is a missed play that allows a batter or runner to advance one or more bases when that could have been avoided given an ordinary level of playing skill as judged by the game officials. So if nobody could have caught that fly, no error. If you should have caught that fly, it's an error. So this is Herman Long, somebody we don't think of often, but uh, he was a 19th century baseball player. He had a 15-year career, and he made a thousand, just over 1,000 errors. He holds the record for the most errors. Somebody should remember him. So this is how doctors want to measure error. They want to measure an error once if a regular doctor, if a good doctor could have got it, then you should have got it. But if nobody could have gotten it, it's not really an error. That's what they think. So this is my friend Hardeep. This is his uh, definition. He calls a diagnostic error a missed opportunity to make a timely or correct diagnosis based on the available evidence. So when there wasn't enough evidence, it's not a misdiagnosis. It's not a diagnostic error. So let me ask you this. Who, I'm not sure I can see everybody, but who thinks that with my patient Shirley, I made a diagnostic error? I'll tell you, I did. I thought I did. Does anybody else think that that's a diagnostic error? You won't hurt my feelings. It can't be worse than I am on myself. So who thinks that's not an error? Anybody? Who thinks that there's just not enough data to really know, that I didn't really share enough for you to know? OK. So some of you think it wasn't an error. And Hardeep would not think that that was an error, because there was not enough data. She wouldn't come to see me. I couldn't listen to her heart over the phone. And Frankly, I wouldn't have thought to ask her because I was totally buying into her own self-diagnosis that she had emphysema. Her emphysema was bad. So that's one way to count them. I argue, and I'm not alone, thankfully, that actually the way to start counting is from the beginning. We should take up a patient-centered sense of where to start counting. That, it, the diag that the diagnostic errors are any diagnosis that's made between the time when a patient first presents to medical attention until the correct diagnosis is made. Now, there are times when you don't have enough data. It is absolutely true that there are times when you don't have enough data to make a diagnosis. But those are important times to count. If you don't define it like this, then my patient Shirley's experience will have taught us nothing. She's not alone, of course. There are lots of people who get missed common diagnoses. If we use something like this, we're going to miss many of those. And I think that people don't want to, di to, to define diagnostic error this way because the numbers are going to be kind of scary. 
really scary. So let's go back to baseball. Here's Ty Cobb. He was a, a baseball player at the uh, beginning of the 20th century. He's famous for having uh, the highest batting average. Still has it. His batting average, 0.3664. That means, I've come to understand, that he missed two out of three at bats. Doctors do not want to have numbers like this associated with what they do. You know, we all wish that we could have a batting average like the Mayo, which is designed really to deal with unusual diseases. You know, I mean, you don't have a medical institution of this size in a small town to deal with the town's problems. No, no, the Mayo is here to deal with everybody's problems. So people come from all over here to here to get a diagnosis, and often they do. We all wish and aspire uh, to that kind of batting average, but chances are we're not going to have it. We're not going to have it. Why don't we want those kinds of numbers? Because this is what we think of when we hear the word error. We think dumb, dumb mistake. We feel like we should put on the dunce cap, sit in the corner, because we're bad doctors, because we made a mistake. And not surprisingly, a lot of the work in diagnostic error has gone into helping people think better. Because we think it's all right here that we made a mistake, not that we made an error. You know, the word error comes from errare. I don't, I don't ever take Latin. I just know this from the dictionary, so I might be saying it wrong. So any natural Latin speakers can correct me on this if I'm wrong. But the word means to wander, and it implies a kind of uncertainty surrounding the exact value. So when we measure something, we have plus or minus, because we acknowledge that there's some certainty around that exact measurement. We're not ashamed of that. We don't hide it. It's right there in the answer. Diagnosis is an extremely uncertain art. You know why? Because we don't know anything. I mean, we are just beginning to chip away at what we know in medicine. And until we can really, literally see into the body and know what's going on, we're taking our best shot. It's a very uncertain practice. But because this is what we think when we hear error, we don't want to go there. An error is not a mistake. And I think until we accept that, it's going to be very hard for us to learn from our diagnostic errors. So we might not agree on exactly what a diagnostic error is, but we can all agree that it would be better if there were a lot fewer of them. So there's been a lot of work. It's really been very impressive as I've watched over these past, really, 10 years that diagnostic error has become something that people get together and think about and talk about. And all of this conversation is focused either on how do we count it so we can tell if we've gotten better and how can we improve. So a lot of work has been done here. It breaks down into two categories, or traditionally, I have thought about it in two ways. How can we help doctors become better diagnosticians, and how can we develop systems to catch and correct the diagnostic errors that get made and get are inevitable? So there's a lot of work here. Here at, at Yale, we start with medical students, and we actually explicitly teach this. Now you think, well, duh. No, no, we didn't teach this before. Uh, in the 1980s, a guy wanted to develop a curriculum in uh, clinical reasoning and how to make a diagnosis. So he looked at the literature and he found nothing. So he started developing the literature, but it's that recent. It's very new. So now we're starting to teach it. So at, at Yale, we start at, with uh, first year medical students just a few weeks into their education, a couple of weeks into their education, we send them into a room with one of these dummies. You can almost see it in the corner there. Um, this dummy that can talk, has a heartbeat and a pulse and a blood pressure and breath sounds. 
uh, and is hooked up to a, a monitor so you can see what their heart rhythms are. And we give them a case. They have no medical training. All they have is their native intelligence and whatever common sense they have. And we ask them to try and puzzle through a difficult case. It's a young woman with abdominal pain. She has uh, an ectopic pregnancy. Um, and their job is to figure it out before it ruptures and she dies right there on the table. Unfortunately, many of these mannequins die. But many don't because they're smart. And then we start with that, with that sort of connection on how diagnosis is made, that it's probability, that it's thinking, and we move from there. So, so we can start teaching it. And one of the things that we know as teachers is that feedback is essential. This is something that is completely missing for doctors. We never get feedback. Drivers have a feedback deficit. That is why 80% of themselves rate themselves above average in driving skills. Why, why not? They're, ha they're not dead yet. They haven't had very many accidents. They're fine. And it's because the feedback that they get, they're often unaware of. For instance, when they cut off the car behind them because they were in the blind spot, the driver that they cut off is, feels obligated, really, to offer some correctional advice about how they might watch where the hell they're going. But of course, the driver doesn't know. He doesn't see that car. If he had seen him, he wouldn't have cut him off in the first place. So there is no real feedback, no real regular feedback. There is the occasional feedback, something that's unavoidable and undeniable, and you can't really ignore it. That's how medicine is. When we see a patient in our office, and they come with, to us with complaints, things that they're concerned about. We listen to them, we diagnose them, we treat them, we send them out, and they don't come back, and we think, yes, another victory for medicine. Actually, there are other possibilities besides them being cured. But we don't ever know if they go to another doctor, another ER, or if they die, rarely only if somebody picks up the phone. So we need some feedback. Um, autopsy, that used to be a form of feedback, but not anymore. We don't, we don't often get autopsies. In my institution, 20% of deaths have autopsies. It used to be 100%. That's the way it is at the big institutions. Smaller institutions, smaller hospitals, zero. So, and autopsy has limitations too. My patient, she would have never been diagnosed at autopsy. Not because she wouldn't have died, because clearly if I hadn't gone to see her, she totally would have died. And she probably wouldn't have gotten autopsy. But even if she had, they would have never figured it out. So there's some limits. We have to address this. And there are ways, there are systems being set up to try and bring back data to the, to the doctor who's made or other provider, nurse practitioners, uh, physician assistants, who have uh, made an incorrect diagnosis. And then there are systems. This is the only system I have time to talk about. But this is a system that was developed at uh, Harvard. They noticed that some labs were more likely to not get acted on than others. And they divided data into three types of data, S stuff that has to be acted on immediately, stuff that has to be acted on soon, and stuff that has to be acted on eventually. And when they looked at it, they found that the stuff that has to be acted on eventually is the stuff that's most likely not to get done. And that's because the first two things are done by the doctor who ordered the test, boom. They see it, they do it, it's done. This other result has to be acted on by somebody else. And somebody has to give that information to that doctor. Now, of course, the doctor who's the outpatient doctor who doesn't take care of the patient in the hospital anymore gets this huge, big stack through the EMR. It's not really a stack anymore, but hundreds of pages documenting every nanosecond of the hospitalization, but it doesn't highlight the things that are really important. It doesn't highlight the fact that the guy had a, what might have been a mass on his chest x-ray, but he wasn't in there for that, so they're not going to deal with it. Could he please follow up? So those were the things they found that were getting lost, and so they set up a system. They just decided, whoever orders the test, tag, you're it. You are the person who has to report that abnormal finding to this person's doctor. And they set up their EMR 
to allow that to be tracked. When I was coming here, uh, the question was, do we know what our patients need? And that made me think about Shirley again, and I thought, what might have helped with Shirley? And I'm going to end just by telling you a few of the thoughts that I had about her. Well, first of all, time. Time matters. The average primary care appointment lasts 10 or 15 minutes. Um, and there's pretty good research that shows that if an appointment lasts, if a doctor spends less than 16 minutes with a patient, their rate of error goes up dramatically. That's the inflection point. So 10 to 15 minutes, you don't get past errors until past 15 minutes. There's something wrong here. Here at Mayo, first, patient, first visit, a patient has 90 minutes with the doctor. I don't know if everybody needs 90 minutes in a normal practice, but there's got to be a way, some point between 90 and 10 where we can agree on. Second, where healthcare delivered matters. Why do the sick have to come to me? Why did she, I insist to Shirley that she had to get out of bed, trudge through the snow, drive through the snow to come to my office so I could tell her that she needed to go to the hospital? That's crazy. But we don't have systems to deliver health care to her at her home. We need that. People don't, should, sick people should not have to travel to be taken care of. And, and, and sick people shouldn't be denied care because they can't travel. Teamwork matters. I, you know, there's been a lot of talk about healthcare teams, and I'm in favor of that. I'm talking about the team that is made by the healthcare doctor, nurse, PA, team, and the patient. The patient has to talk, and the doctor has to listen, and it has to go the other way, too. I listened to Shirley. She didn't want to go to the hospital. That was fine with me as long as I thought it was her lungs. When I realized it was her heart, I, I explained, she listened, and she went. We're on each other's team. Nobody's voice trumps the other. And I think that's essential. Fundamentally, making the right diagnosis as quickly and efficiently as possible is the most cost-effective care we can deliver. If you look at where healthcare dollars go, so many of them go for unnecessary testing. They're not labeled unnecessary testing because the doctor who ordered them thinks that that's necessary, but in fact, it's not necessary. So my plea is to let us try to stop burying our mistakes, our errors, really, that we should bring them out into the open, count them, identify the problems, and see if we can't make things better so that our patients, so that Shirley and everybody like her can get the care that they need. Thanks very much. We're going to let you go to break in just a moment. I have one question. How do patients who are empowered, and we talked a lot about that over the last couple of days, uh, improve diagnosis? What kinds of information can patients deliver better? And I'm thinking of some of the diagnostic tools that Vaughn was talking about. If patients were taking a greater amount of data than simply anecdotal, I feel like my emphysema's back, would that help diagnosis? I think one thing that can definitely help is that patients have to share their personal data. So the data that they have that comes from their bodies is, is data that we cannot access except through talking to them. And so one of the mistakes that I talked about with Shirley that I made, that she made, is she diagnosed herself and I mindlessly accepted that diagnosis. She didn't say, I'm short of breath and I'm coughing up sputum, it doesn't have any, she didn't tell me all that, she just said, I have it back and I foolishly let her keep that. So one of the things, of course, is that patients have to share the data that they have access to that no one else is. But also, I think patients have to own their health. It's not like it's their problem, but certainly it's important to them. So if that means that they can look things up and read about things, you know, people talk about this, this despair when patients come in with a stack of papers that they've printed off from the inter internet. Give me that any day over the patient who comes in and I say, do you have any medical problems? Yeah. Do you take any medicines? 
Yeah, what are they? I don't know. It's in my record, just look at my record. That's not working for me. It's not working, it's not working for them. So they have to own their own health. I deal mostly with a poor population, and so their, what they can do is gonna be a little bit different than what regular people can do. And from all of us, we all Google our own diagnoses, we all look up the things that we think might be going on, we're all tuned in and paying attention and know, have our medication list and know what the side effects are. Those are all important things. I take care of a population that doesn't even have access to Google. Um, wouldn't know what to Google often if they did. And so for them, all I can hope is that they learn, that I can help them learn that this is their health, and together, as a team, we can figure it out. Lisa, thanks so much. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm such a fan of yours. Oh,